Hi, fellow seekers. Sorry for the lack of communication. Been working on something of a labor of love. For those who don't know, it's a biography of Lisa Meitner, the woman who discovered atomic fission. Additionally, I've been repeatedly jerked around by Audacity in the last few days, and YouTube has disabled my community tab. So there's that, too. In my last community post, I asked what topics you would like for a short video, and you produced a flood of good suggestions, none of which, I'm afraid, would fit into a 5-10 to 10 minute running time. So I decided to do another update, this one to my Universe of Water series. Don't get too excited. It's an update to my Top 10 Trans-Neptunians list. Over the last few years, a number of changes have occurred that weren't enough for a video on their own, but taken together, provide enough content for an exoplanetary amuse-bouche, shall we say. In my original list, I was mildly disparaging to the twins 2002 MS4 and 2002 AW197. But I can admit to prejudice when I fall victim to it. Their lack of notable characteristics had more to do with dismissal on the part of astronomers. Lack of interest leads to lack of study, leading to lack of interest. But in the last five years, God, has it been so long, eyes have finally turned on them, and perspectives have changed. First off, names. Since Mike Brown has resolutely refused to name his less interesting discoveries, the IAU, for once in its ineffectual existence, and all of a month ago, finally took the reins and acknowledged posterity. 2002 MS4 and 2002 AW197 are now officially 307261 Mani and 55565 Aya. Mani was the moon in Norse mythology, though unusually a man rather than a woman, while Aya was the goddess of the dawn and the wife of the sun in Babylonian mythology. In keeping with IAU statute for the naming of classical Kuiper Belt objects, they are both gods of creation. While Mani remains the dull gray lump depicted in the list, it has since, possibly, gained an adornment, a vast crater. A series of star occultations in 2020, undertaken across 116 telescope locations, allowed astronomers to map Mani's shape for the first time and learned that it had a dent in it. About a quarter of its circumference was sliced off, neat as a pair of scissors. This is likely due to a near-world-shattering crater similar to the Herschel crater on Mimas. Like any respectable crater, Manis has a raised rim, roughly as tall as Olympus Mons, the tallest mountain in the solar system. There has been recent speculation that if 2010 measurements with Spitzer and Herschel are correct, Mani may be emitting more heat than expected for such a small, distant body. If this is true, it may indicate an as-yet-undetected satellite. Perhaps my biggest mistake was in misrepresenting Aya as resembling her dark sister, Salacia. But in fact, she is both dark red, thanks to the presence of tholins on her surface, and spheroidal, as her brightness varies little with time. Also along for the ride is what would have been my list number 11, 2003 AZ84, now known as Aklis, the goddess of sorrow in Homer's Iliad, depicted as a dark mist. While it stretches the definition a bit, the name could be said to apply to an underworld deity, as is demanded for those objects that share Pluto's orbit. Like Orcus, its fellow walker of Pluto's mark, Achlis is near futureless in the visible spectrum, suggesting an overall grey cast. But like Haumea, the more vibrant classical KBO, it is likely elongated, perhaps by as much as two to one, by its fast seven-hour rotation. Early observations suggested that, much like Pluto and Orcus, Achlis may possess a satellite, but it has yet to be confirmed. So, what is the largest unnamed object in the solar system now? 2013 FY27. There really is no way to give these designations an entrance. FY27 is a frustrating object. At around 770 kilometers in diameter, 
it lies on the threshold for dwarf planethood, but no one can tell if it qualifies because no one knows its density. This is despite the fact that it has a satellite, about 200 kilometers in diameter, discovered a full seven years ago, which should, as satellites have done since the time of Newton, give us its mass. But as yet, for whatever reason, the satellite's orbit remains undetermined. More troubling and equivocal news has arisen in the last few weeks regarding the search for the ever-ephemeral Planet Nine. Is it here? Is it there? Is it, well, anywhere? We still don't know, and recent findings have not helped resolve the issue. The first knock of the fragile gathering of evidence for Planet Nine arrived in the form of 2017 OF201, which, despite its name, was only discovered this year. 201 is a large, almost dwarf planet-sized object unearthed in May by Si Hao Cheng and colleagues from archive images of the Dark Energy Camera Legacy Survey. Its designation comes from the time period in which it was detected. 201 is about 700 kilometers in diameter, placing it in the gray zone below probable dwarf planethood, where temperature plays as much a role as composition in determining roundness. That said, given that its light curve shows very little variation as it rotates, it is likely spherical. It is also, like many objects of its ilk, red, though not as red as Sedna. It is in its orbit that 201 really flummoxes. From a perihelion of 45 AU, it stretches out to a staggering 1632 AU, farther even than Sedna. Somewhat ironically, 201 was found in a search for Planet 9. I say ironically because its discoverers initially claimed it was a mark against Planet 9's existence. Its orbital elements, like the famous argument of perihelion, did not align with the clustering that forms the basis for the Planet 9 hypothesis. But Mike Brown and Constantine Batygin, Planet 9's initial formulators and staunchest defenders, immediately argued that with a perihelion of just 45 AU, it was still within the gravitational influence of Neptune, and so has no bearing on Planet Nine's existence. The same cannot be said for 2023 KQ-14. Although discovered in 2023 as part of a Subaru telescope survey, it was only announced in April this year. KQ-14, nicknamed Ammonite, due to it having been discovered by the Fossil, or Formation of the Outer Solar System Icy Legacy Survey, is a physically unremarkable object of about 300 kilometers in diameter, roughly the size of a large asteroid. What is remarkable about it is its orbit. With a perihelion of 68 AU and an aphelion of 438 AU, it unquestionably belongs to that sparse but growing population of inexplicable objects known as sednoids. Unlike distant scattered objects like 201, sednoids have no plausible rationale for their existence. Even if an object's perihelion is 45 AU, half again as far as Neptune, it is still arguable that Neptune could have flung it out into deep space at some point in the past. There is no arguing with sednoids. According to any of our models, they should not exist. The fact that the three known sednoids prior to Ammonite, Sedna, Lele and 2012 VP113, clustered in their orbits, was the founding pillar of the Planet Nine hypothesis. But Ammonite's orbit lies opposite to those of the other sednoids. Such a discovery does not, yet, disprove Planet Nine but it does place constraints on where and what it could be. Ammonite's discovery team formulated an alternate model for the orbits observed, one requiring the passage of a planet-sized body, though not, incidentally, a star-sized body, through our distant solar system just 300 million years after its formation. If this formulation is correct, then Planet Nine cannot be. Brown and Batygin have yet to formally respond to the discovery of Ammonite 
and its implications for their hypothesis. But theory, ultimately, will not find Planet Nine. Only the hard, endless grunt work that is astronomy. The Vera Rubin has the best chance of finding Planet Nine, if it is there, but cannot prove it is not there if it does not find it. Finding planets is difficult. Disproving them exponentially more so. It took 15 years of searching to find Pluto, but 59 years and Voyager 2 to disprove Planet X. The rewards for disproving planets vary. Sometimes, as with Planet X, we get a slightly slimmer Neptune. Sometimes, as with Vulcan, a completely different formulation of the universe. Variations of both have been suggested as alternatives for Planet Nine. Let us hope that, if Planet Nine proves illusory, our reward is worth its loss.